Welcome to another episode of Tim's Love and Garden. Okay, so I'm just going to do Mother Nature Part um, 20, and I'm going to be talking about all about irrigation, or basically watering your, um, your plants. Now, irrigation and watering your plants, basically, it's 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 one of the things that that's quite time consuming, and if you do it um, certain ways, you know, you can save yourself a lot of time. Now, I've in the past I've spent potentially um, sort of one or two hours a night, sort of going around the plot, making sure everything's got the you know the water that it needs when you know when we've got hot conditions, dry conditions, and. Uh, most certainly if you live in the UK you can't predict the conditions. Today's been 30 degrees outside and uh, and obviously you know I'm, I'm going to need to do some watering tonight to basically to you know to replenish the water that we've clearly lost out of the ground during the daytime. And watering really comes in um, sort of four main types. Um, there are others I know that but uh, you know the four main types that people sort of use um, largely sort of um, watering by uh, watering can. Now watering by water can, it's, it's got some advantages and disadvantages. It's specific so you're actually delivering it to the plant where you need it. Um, you, you can deliver a known quantity so you know if you've got a watering can you know you can make sure that uh, you know that, that, that each plant's getting a pint or two pints of water. Um, it's, um, it's easy to add fertilizers and things like that into the watering can so if you are watering like a greenhouse that would be the you know the easiest way of doing it because you're going to be putting in your, you, you know your sort of your organic fertilisers that you've made from either your wormery or your comfrey, um, and you can be you, you know making sure that you're putting two cans of water on, um, you, you know where your tomatoes are every night, so you know you've got a known quantity. Um, the disadvantages are it can be hard work. Um, you know you've got to carry sort of two sort of. Um, sort of gallon watering cans up and down, you know, and you you know you're potentially going to do that. I don't know a dozen times to water everything that you need to water in the night, um, and um, you know the other advantage that you are you, you know the watering can is you can obviously recycle sort of rainwater. So obviously you know as you know I've got water butts to collect rainwater from the shed, and that's so you know you can actually re reuse uh, sort of rainwater that you've collected and that's got various advantages you know the water's um, sort of much purer and you've not got sort of high concentrations of chlorine in it and stuff like that so you know there is that advantage as well however it is time consuming and it is hard work. The other more um, sort of you know sort of the next sort of most popular way of watering which you see quite often is, is by hose pipe and that's where people are going around with a the, with the hose pipe connected to a tap and they're sort of sprinkling water on wherever needs to be watered and, and all the rest of it or you know sort of applying it to the ground and this can also be um, you know sort of specific so you actually go into sort of various plants and watering the, the, the pots or the ground where you, you know you need to uh, you need to water again it can be a known amount because you can be you know you know how much water is going to be coming out of the you know the hose pipe so when I use a hose pipe you know, I can I can sort of gauge how much water I'm putting onto the um, you know you know onto the ground. Um, it can damage plants in this in the sense that you know you can get a bit of a jet and um, obviously in um, you know with a hose pipe you typically are using tap water. Tap water has got chlorine in it and and that chlorine can build up in the ground, which can potentially be damaging to some plants. Um, and you know so the levels of chlorine in the soil will rise um, if you you know if you use too much of it. And um, the other thing as well is with a watering can, it is reasonably easy to get water on the foliage of plants, which could potentially damage the uh, you know the plants that way as well. So there are that sort of disadvantages. But with a hose pipe, it's most certainly easy. You need to watch what you're doing, obviously, with a hose pipe, because what you can do is if you're trailing a hose pipe around, what you can do inadvertently is knock plants over or damage them behind you. So uh, you know, so there is potential for you know sort of damaging uh, plants and that as well. 
Another way of using a hose pipe, rather than just having the sort of the jet on the end or the or the sort of the sprinkling device, what you can do is actually use a sprinkler. So you've got a, um, a sprinkler and you connect the hose pipe to it, and then that there's obviously a couple of different types. Some that spin around and some that sort of go backwards and forwards, um, and, and sort of sprinkle the ground. These are quite useful. It's something that I use, and I tend to use um, this on crops like the, the brassicas, the because you can't damage the foliage with those. Um, onions, um, you know, the parsnips, so the, basically the bottom end of the, uh, uh, the allotment I use sprinkler on and basically what I do is I've got a, an old um, shopping basket if you like turned upside down with some legs, you've probably seen it on previous videos and all I do is I put the sprinkler on top of that which basically elevates it above the plant so as it's going backwards and forwards no plants are sort of interrupting the flow of water if you like so it's not concentrating in one area. Um, the, the advantages of this is it's easy you know, you deliver a known quantity of water. So if you're, you know, if you leave it in one position for around 20 minutes, you know, you know, you've delivered a certain amount of water. It can be a little bit waste, wasteful because it's not specific. So you know, you're watering basically everything. So you're not only watering the plant, you're also potentially watering bare pieces of ground, and that's where you're going to get weeds growing and all the rest of it. Um, you're getting potentially getting foliage wet, so that's another disadvantage. Um, you can potentially overwater or underwater. You know, you, you know, you need to, you know, you need to keep your um, your eye on the time, so you know a certain positions are 20 minutes, and then move it, you know, sort of thing. Um, again, using tap water, unless you've got some kind of pump off a, um, you know, water butt system. And uh, the other main advantage for sprinklers is they can be automatic. Now you can reasonably cheaply get these little sort of timers, which is basically battery powered. So if you're going away on holiday or something like that, or if you're elderly and you want to sort of water your garden, what you can do is set them quite reasonably cheaply. Um, you know, you set up the sprinkler with this valve timer, if you like, and what it'll do is it'll come on for half an hour in the morning and water the garden, or half an hour at night, or both, whatever. And what you can do is actually water the um, the garden. You know, you sort of set it up and make sure that it's all in the right place and it's watering the right things, and then you can just leave that going. You can also have other systems that you water greenhouses with as well on a timer as well. You know, the, you know, you can get reasonably complicated with this, but uh, obviously the more complicated you get, the more sort of costly it is. Um, but you can get, you know, sort of timers and, you know, the sprinkler will sort of automatically water the lawn or the or the whole garden or whatever for you. So there are those advantages as well. The last um, type I want to talk about are sea poses. And sea poses are quite useful because um, basically what you do is you run them. Um, a sea pose is made from like a porous rubber. And uh, what will happen is you basically you connect that to the pipe. You need pressure. You need mains water pressure. So you need around two bars of pressure. If you are running this from a water butt, you'll need some kind of pump to do it. You can't just connect this to a, um, a, a water butt or a barrel because the, basically the pressure is not there to, to drive it through. Um, and, and basically what this will do is basically you, you, you run the pipe around the, the plants near the roots. And um, what that will do is it'll deliver the water to the roots, but it won't get the foliage wet, which is, which is, which is a really good advantage. The crops like potatoes, um, it, it's really useful for, and I'll be putting some around my potatoes very shortly. I'll probably put that in this video, in fact. Um, and it, it's good because you can deliver a reasonable amount of water directly to the ground. You're not going to get any water on the foliage, which is obviously to be avoided, because you can, for certain crops, you know, like... Uh, Plants that can get damage on the on the leaves, or or um, like potatoes, you can get blight, fungus forming on the leaves. So you don't want to get the leaves wet. Obviously, tomatoes are the same. Um, it um, you can potentially overwater or underwater. You need to again, you need to keep your eye on the time. So if you pour any time, you need to make sure you you know you got it on for 20 minutes or half an hour. So you know you've delivered a certain amount of water, and. Um, you can again make this automatic, you know, so you can have some kind of timer which comes on for half an hour or so, and uh, you know, you know that'll that'll sort of you know water the garden for half an hour and then come off. Um, so th there are, there are those advantages as well. There are other um, there are other means of sort of um, irrigating the ground if you like. You know, you can have sort of drip feeds, which which some of you mentioned in the past, where you've got some kind of bottle. And you sort of fill that bottle up, and then that will slowly drip onto your tomatoes and your greenhouse, or your cucumbers, or whatever. And uh, you know you can do that, but obviously you've got to fill that with a watering can or or, or or something. Or you can, in some countries, obviously not in Britain, but uh, in some countries, what you can do is, is also dig trenches as well, and then sort of run water um, streams and stuff through there. And you know you can obviously irrigate the ground that way as well. Um, the one thing that you need to be mindful of with irrigation is uh, one thing you can do is get the uh, waterlogged ground. You know you don't want to over irrigate, 
uh, you know you don't want to overwater because what you can do is you can get waterlogged ground and a lot of plants don't like water you, you know in the ground all the time plants need water obviously for the um, you know you know for the plant to grow and develop and breathe you know obviously it needs water to go up and you know to do the photosynthesis so we can convert um, you know as I've, as I've explained before you know it'll convert carbon dioxide into the um, all the you know as I've explained in the past I don't want to go into that again but um, obviously so every plant needs water some plants need more than others um, but uh, what you can do is um, if you're not too careful if you overwater um, even even if you've got well draining ground if you overwater what you can do is wash the minerals out of the soil um, which is obviously to be avoided so all of that good sort of uh, compost and, and, and you know and matter that you put into the ground over the winter for your, for your vegetables if you overwinter uh, what you're going to be doing is, is washing all those minerals and, and fertilizer and everything else out of the soil into the you know into the water table and the and basically the plants won't get the benefit of them so you need to be careful that you don't overwater for that reason as well so you need enough water regularly uh, but what you don't want to do is overwater that's that you know you can cause as much damage over watering as you can by not watering at all so you know you need to get the balance right um, things that you can do to to reduce the need for watering you know if you've got a garden which is reasonably um, sort of dry and, and, and you know and you don't want to sort of spend too much time watering what you can be doing is using things like mulches um, putting lots of uh, compost and sort of carbon matter into the ground digging all that in and that's going to help um, the, the, the soil to retain the water when it does receive water from the rain or when you actually water it um, and obviously mulch will stop the uh, the ground from drying out through the through the wind and obviously evaporation from the sun so you know there are things that you can do um, also as well putting membrane down on the floor and planting through membrane is going to hold a certain amount of moisture in the ground as well but uh, if you have got sort of certain crops and vegetables that you know that there are needing water uh, you know, sort of thinking about mulch, uh, mulches and, and, and compost and stuff like that is another way to go, which will actually reduce your need to water that plant. But uh, in summary, that's all about watering. Okay, so these are the sea poses. What I've done is I've stretched out the um, the four reels because basically when you first buy them, they're in like a, um, a roll. So what you need to do is relax the um, the pipe so they'll they'll actually lay flat on the ground. If you try and take them straight off the roll and sort of roll them across the uh, the garden, what you'll find is they'll sort of try to coil back up and uh, they won't kind of sit on the ground and um, you know sort of sit straight what you can do is pin them down with some um, tent pegs which you can buy from most camping shops or just a sort of loop of wire or something like that or even just a brick end on the end but uh, um, you know you can sort of pin them down on the ground and all the sea pose is basically is um, it's like a porous rubber um, pipe and as you can see this one here is actually on and what happens is the water um, just gently you can see it dripping there gently comes out of the pipe and um, applies the water directly to the ground and obviously what you need to do is run these pipes right by um, where the, the base of your plants are and then uh, basically the water will seep out of here onto the ground. Um, the benefits of this obviously of you know you're not getting the foliage wet so things like this are ideal for um, you know sort of crops like potatoes and things like that where you'd where you're avoiding to uh, get the leaves wet. But uh, what I've done here is um, I've just rolled them out um, up the lawn. Obviously these are all new and uh, the reason I've done this is what I want to do is make sure that they all work, there's no leaks and there's no kind of sprays anywhere or anything like that uh, before I actually put them, put them into the potatoes because obviously as soon as you have put them in um, um, your garden, um, you know, if you do have any sort of problems or anything like that, obviously they're a lot more difficult to deal with as soon as they're in the allotment than... Uh, so, so what I suggest if you do buy any of these, unroll them out, leave them out outside for 24 hours or so. Um, just you know, not running water through them, just just leave them sort of along there. And all I've done is just weight the weight the uh, the ends down with a brick just to sort of stretch them out. If you do try on a warm day, that's ideal because what it'll do is it'll it'll warm the um, warm the, uh, the 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 rubber up a little bit, and it'll just um, allow it to relax and um, effectively find its. Um, you know so it'll 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 stay straight rather than trying to coil back up and um, as soon as you've done that um, you can put them up your potato patches or obviously you know you can run them up your lines of onions or, or whatever vegetable and uh, you know you can water them
um, just by connecting the hose and uh, leaving it on for half an hour or so and what it'll do is it'll, it'll deliver the water directly to the roots of the plants where you need it and it won't be watering the, the foliage or anything like that which is basically to be avoided. Okay so there's the, uh, the seep hoses in position so as you can see I've got them running up between the potato rows and it runs all the way down. You can't quite see them but it's, it's actually under here as you can see that's also delivering water to the ground there. Um, obviously the, uh, the end that you connect the hose to it's always sort of going to come out there a little quicker but it does sort of deliver all the way around. Um, so that's the way, um, you, you know, one of the recommended ways for watering your uh, potatoes and this is actually the first time this year I've actually watered them to be honest with you so I'm just running the hoses around now. Um, obviously things like um, obviously things like the uh, um, courgettes and stuff like that obviously that's more specific watering because I only really want to water the plant itself so whilst I'm watering these obviously I don't want to get the potatoes wet so I'll water these with a hose pipe as long with the sort of sweet potatoes and stuff like that and then when I'm watering uh, the onions these brassica cages, um, these got watered last night, as you can see the ground is still sort of reasonably wet. Um, but the, the crops that are more sort of shallow rooted, um, I'll just wait for the, uh, the, the, the spring to actually move. There you go, so these are the um, sort of the parsnip and the spinach and uh, the beetroot and all the rest of it in the swede. Um, these are the ones that sort of need a reasonable amount of water because they're reasonably shallow shallow rooted so what I do is um, water them with a sprinkler as you can see there's the sprinkler um, and as I explained earlier on I've got that sitting on top of a um, an old shopping uh, basket upturned with um, sort of four legs made out of just four pieces of pipe I've just got those cable tied on and what I find is if I do that it sort of elevates it up around sort of three or four foot off the ground and um, what they'll actually do is, you know, if, if I put that sprinkler directly onto the ground, um, what it'll do is um, it'll sort of, you know, the sort of the jets of water will be stopped by the plants and also you could potentially damage the plants as well where it's, uh, where it's on the ground. So I always do that and basically all I do is I just move this whole arrangement, if you like, um, to the front of the allotment or what I also do is um, I either put it in this tunnel, sort of in the middle, and then I also put it in uh, this tunnel here towards that side there and I water the onions and the, the brassicas all at the same time. So I just want to go through the comments that have come over from the last week or so. The first one comes from Ken Fuller and um, he was talking about, obviously I put a, um, a video out midweek talking about me constructing the, the next um, tunnel. And um, Ken's also making a tunnel, but he's, he's going to make his out of a wooden frame. And um, he's, he's, he had this idea of um, sort of putting um, net over it in the summer and use it as a, as a um, you know, like a fruit cage. And then in the winter putting sort of polythene over it and using it as like a sort of polytunnel type affair over the, um, over the winter months. Now, I have thought of this, Ken, to be honest with you. The one thing, I, I, I have had some experience with polytunnels. And uh, to be honest with you, it is really easy to um, to rip the plastic. So what you need to be doing is, if you are making it out of wood, you need to make sure that the that there's you know there's nice smooth edges for the for the plastic to go over. And as the wind blows and it all sort of moves about, you will get some chafing in there. So what you need to make sure is there's no sharp edges or burrs or anything like that going in, because that will most certainly tear into the plastic. And then as soon as the wind gets under it, it'll obviously tear it all off. So you need to be careful with the plastic. With with a metal frame which is a lot easier but what I would suggest is if you are going to put plastic over um, think about putting something soft onto the wood um, you know between the wood and the um, and the polythene you know you can get some like sort of pipe lagging or um, even just some you know some foam rubber of some kind you, you know where the sharp edges are just to protect the plastic a little bit and last last week I actually went over to um, an organic garden not too far from me in, uh, over in Wrighton which is kind of the other side of Coventry and um, they would got a few polytunnels there and I was looking at the way that they'd done it and the one thing that I had noticed is on the corners what they've, had, what, what they've actually done is taped it together so there's like a like a wide sort of sellotape um, I'd say it's probably about four inches wide and then right at the end of the tunnel what they've done is they've basically got the plastic stretched it over and then the, the bits that make up like the gable ends if you like what they've done is they've put them on and what they've done is they've taped the two pieces of plastic together with this sort of sticky um, 
it, you know, sort of, it looks like salad tape, but it's obviously a lot more industrial than that. And then they've got um, round the edges, they've got like a sort of bendy plastic um, sort of section that they've screwed through the plastic onto the metal framework on the inside to hold it all in. Now, because you'd be taking your sort of net off and your polythene on and so on and off like this during the you know the you know the summer and the winter and stuff, what I would suggest, to be honest with you, is um, rather than having net, if you, if you are thinking use it as a panel tunnel in the winter, what I would suggest you do is basically make it into a polytunnel and then just open up the sides during the summer. Um, so what you can do is you can have like the like the roof part of it as being an up um, you know sort of polythene all the time, and then have the sides and. and so you've got basically, you've got the archway if you like, like that. So the, the actual bendy part of the arch, you've got the plastic on there all the time. And then it's attached at the bottom of the arch. And then the walls you can kind of roll up and roll down. You know, so you can roll them down in the winter. That's where I'd, I, if, if I was going to make a ton of polytunnel stroke, um, you know, sort of brassica, um, you know, sort of cage in the, in the summer, I would think about leaving the plastic on the roof all the time and then and then have the walls of it so you've got netting and plastic and so you can roll up the plastic during the summer and let the air flow, you know, in and out. So then in the winter you can just roll the plastic down and use it as a pony tunnel. That's what I would think about if I was you. So leave the roof part plastic all the while and then have the, have the sides of it um, sort of interchangeable between netting and polythene, if you like. Um, so if, if I was going to do it, I'd, I'd kind of think around um, sort of them lines. I have thought about it up here, but to be honest with you, the wind that we get up here is absolutely incredible. During the winter, you know, we can get sort of 80, 90 mile an hour winds running through here. And there's been um, quite a few people over the last sort of 10 years or so whilst I've been up here that have had polytunnels and within 12 months they're just completely shredded. So I've always sort of avoided putting a polytunnel up because I know for a while it's probably going to get damaged. So if I was to put one up here it would have to be really well anchored down and it would have to be really well you know sort of made um, you know because the polythene would get battered about and it would get ripped. Um, if you are going to buy polythene um, go out and get the right polythene and that's the best thing I can advise you. There are various companies particularly on the internet um, that, 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 that sell the polythene to make polytunnels and always go for the best grade, you know, you can get various grades of it um, and I would always definitely buy the best grade, you know, spend your money and do it right first time and then it's going to last you sort of 20 odd years whereas if you buy the thinner stuff the chances are it's going to rip and tear and it's not going to be uh, right and you'll be replaced again in a couple of years so I'd, I'd spend your money wisely and, and get the, uh, the good quality stuff um, first time around if I was you. Anyway, the next one comes from Foodie Laura. Foodie Laura says, what do you do with your broccoli um, um, and how do you store it? Basically, we don't store it, we just eat it as and when it's um, ready. And I, I did leave a quick note for you um, um, to answer you, but basically what we do is we typically either have it on, um, um, you know, sort of Sunday lunches, have it as a, a sort of side vegetable or whatever. Um, and then um, what I also do is make um, broccoli bake and all that is, is get about... Uh, to serve five people, I have, I, I have about that much sort of um, um, sort of half a half a sort of, well, so sort of two mugs full of um, um, the curly pasta, sort of two or three mugs of that. Boil that up, and then I have um, a really good saucepan of um, broccoli. So you know, sort of five, six, seven heads of broccoli, so nice big sized heads, and then I chop all that up reasonably small. Boil that up, boil the pasta up. And then what I do is I make a, um, a cheese sauce. I do a bit of a cheat cheese sauce. I, I don't make a roux. I make, uh, basically I just boil about two, two pints of milk, one and a half pints of milk. Um, as soon as it comes to the boil, then I mix in um, a mixture of uh, milk and corn flour. I typically have about three heaped tablespoons of corn flour in some milk. Mix that in, pour that in, thicken it up with that. And then I just add probably around a kilo of... Uh, or so of uh, cheese, uh, depending on what mood I'm in. It's, it's typically around, I don't know, about 700 grams of cheese, shall we say. And then um, I'll mix that in with the pasta and the, um, the broccoli. Put that all in a big baking dish and then I'll sprinkle some more cheese on the top. Put that in the oven for, I don't know, half an hour or so, just to sort of brown the top off and that. And then uh, that goes down to store with my kids, so I, you, you know, I make that quite often. And I also make that with the purple sprouted broccoli in the winter as well, so that's, that's always a nice quick tea. It only takes about probably about, uh, I don't know, half an hour or so when it's on the plate, so 
really, you know, you can, you know, sort of quickly make it. It's probably about 10, 15 minutes with the faffing about chopping things up and boiling them. And then, and then as soon as you've got it boiled, you just mix it all up, chuck it in the oven, sit down, have a cup of tea for, you know, for sort of 10, 15 minutes, and then just serve it up and away you go. So that's, that's always a good one for broccoli, but I don't actually store it, to be honest with you. Um, next one comes from um, Allotment Upcycling. Um, and this one's um, all about um, sowing vegetables in modules. Now, um, Tina, who's from Allotment Upcycling, um, she was saying she's sown uh, beetroot into modules and then she's planted them out. To be honest with you, um, Tina, I'm going to do a lot more of this from now on. Um, as you know, earlier on this year, I planted all of the Swedes into modules, which is the first time I've ever done it. And what I did is I planted them all into modules, waited till they'd grown, germinated, and then I planted them out individually. And the results I've got is a hundred percent better than what I had last year. I'm really pleased with the results. So from now on I'm going to be doing um, most certainly the parsnips I'm going to be doing in the parsnip propagator. Most certainly the um, the Swedes I'm going to be doing like that. Probably beetroot. And I also know somebody who does the carrots like that as well. So I may even try to do some carrots um, in that way. But obviously you need the deeper ones like the parsnips to do that. But uh, what I'm going to be doing over the winter, just like I constructed the parsnip propagator, I'm going to be making more of those. Um, I'm going to get hold of some plastic and uh, make some more sort of parsley propagators if you like. Very much the same design, quite possibly twice the size so I've got more in, in, in one lot and obviously saving loads of pot bottles and then I'm going to be growing most of the vegetables like that um, this year, um, you know, that I did with the parsley this year and next year because I think really the, the results you get are much better. You can, you can get a head start on your crops in the greenhouse and then as soon as the weather warms up in May, you can get them outside. And um, I mean, if you look at my Swede compared to other people's Swedes and the um, allotments, they're considerably better. And, and I think because you get, um, you do get sort of bugs in that. I, I got my Swedes attacked last year with, um, I think it was the, uh, was it the mealy bug or? I'm not quite sure, but some insect had a go at it, a little beetle had a go at them. And if you can get the plants to sort of that big before you put them out, you don't get that problem. If you can get the plants established enough before you put them in the ground, a lot of these bugs that attack them when they're small don't bother. Um, so I think that you know you sort of get around as well. And it's a you know from an organic point of view, you you know you put less stuff on the ground to you know to protect stuff as well. So I think it's the better way to go. So next year I'm going to be doing a lot more of that, and probably from now on because I seem to get much better results. Uh, next one comes from um, Nigel. Um, from Muddy Boots and he was saying how are your sunflowers doing? They're doing really well um, to, um, to be honest with you Nigel. Uh, the ones that I've put along the, uh, the front here which were the first ones to go in they're about kind of coming off the four foot I know I need to tie them back. Um, I've got some more out here that I need to put out and they're struggling a little bit to be honest. I'm a bit behind because I've been busy this week again. Uh, the ones that um, I had the second batch they're really leggy, they need to go out this weekend as well, so I'll be planting them out this weekend. But but yes, they are doing well. The ones that I've put in about three weeks ago, they're doing really well. They're sort of about this wide, and there's some nice sort of heads forming on them. So hopefully I'll get some sunflowers before too much longer. Um, the next one comes from uh, Mark Davidson, and he was saying um, in his allotment you can't get, have any permanent standing buildings and stuff like that, so you need to be careful when we're talking about putting the greenhouse up and that. Um, and there was a few conversations between sort of Sandy Moth and and, and, and that last week. Um, yes, you're right. We've got the same kind of regulations here. You can't put anything that's permanently standing here, so you can't build anything out of brick or anything like that. But you, you are at liberty to put um, sort of slabs down and stuff. But um, what they like you to do is to put the slabs directly onto the ground. Don't put any gravel or sand under or anything like that. Um, so if anybody wants to take them up, they can take them up, and basically you've just got earth again. Um, Having said that, there are quite a few people I've noticed recently who have, um, who have I think they've pushed the, pushed the, uh, the limit out a bit and they've, they've actually um, used some concrete and stuff. Um, not, not too much, you can still fetch it out, but, uh, but yeah, you need to be careful. If you are going to put anything in, you, know, you need to make sure that it's not a permanent standing structure. You know, it needs to be made out of sort of wood and it need, you know, if you've got any slab or anything like that, um, that, that, that you know, it's, it's sort of easily removed. Uh, the next one comes from um, Revive UK, and uh, this was a this was a bit of um, um, sort of um, suggestion again from uh, Ravnos talking about the um, Trevor from Ravnos talking about the um, putting up the greenhouse and stuff like that. And uh, Re uh, Revive UK, she very kindly put on. If you're looking for slabs or sheds or, or, or anything like that, look on um, either Gumtree or Free Cycle. 
um, she said she got a couple of sheds from there for nothing and um, so if you are looking for any materials to make stuff in your allotment there are two places to, uh, you, you know that you can go to have a look so okay and the next question comes from um, Brian Hubbery and also Wayne um, Haycock who's, who's also um, said that their broccoli has um, come early and basically the plants are only kind of two foot high and uh, they've started to form the heads and stuff like that. Now I've, I've heard from probably half a dozen if not more people throughout the country now who have um, because of these strange weather conditions you know they've had this um, you know this this sort of early um, sort of crop coming from the broccoli which really is, is, is a good thing as I say you know these these um, uh, ones that I'm going to put back in, you know, they're growing like mad and these are going to be ready to go in in the next couple of weeks. So what I'm going to do is I've cut out, on mine, what I've done is I've cut out all of the hearts, I let them develop till they were kind of this big, and then I've cut them and we've, we've eaten all of them. And now just behind the, the, the sort of the centre one, if you like, there's about another five or six small ones that are coming through, which are kind of, I don't know, probably about the... About, about sort of three inches across and what I'm going to do is harvest all of that as soon as I've harvested that I'm going to be taking all of those plants out quickly dig the ground over and um, tread it all back down and then I'm going to be planting out this this kind of second batch and then what I'll have is um, you know if I can get those in in the next week or so I'm going to have sort of all of July August and um, sort of sort of going into September as well for the you know for the second batch to um, you know basically develop and sort of grow into the uh, the plant. So all being well, I'm going to have two crops of um, broccoli this year. So really, you know, when you look at it how it, how it sort of worked out. We've actually got um, sort of two for the price of one, if you like. So um, you know, you know, from a succession of um, crops. So really. I know we've had strange weather this uh, this year, you know, we've had really hot days, we've had dry, we've had wet periods and we've had really cool nights. I mean, I've seen I've seen temperature sweeps over, over, you know, over the last couple of months that really, I can't remember when we last had weather like that, you know, we've had sort of, sort of 17, 18, 19, 20 degrees in the day and it's been really nice and warm and then at night it's kind of dropped down to sort of 2, 3, 4 degrees and uh, the temperature's been sort of sweeping up and down like this for the past couple of months. So we've had quite a strange spring. Um, the summer looks like it's going to be hot. Uh, most certainly next week, um, you know, we've we've been predicted potentially um, 30 degrees up in the Midlands, sort of 35 down in London. So, which which for this time of year, that's really hot. Um, but again, you know, it, it may go well reasonably cool at night. So um, we'll have to see how we go. But in the grand scheme of things, I don't think we've done too badly. Okay, and the next one comes from um, Sandra M, and she's got a problem with leaf mine, and she asked me. What do you do? Basically, leaf miner. There's a few. There's a few different varieties. Typically, they're actually uh, the moths, and what they'll do is they'll lay their larvae on the uh, the leaf, and then obviously they burrow through. Um, and they also um, sort of um, um, lay the larvae in the ground as well. So this this is this is basically the way you need to um, sort of sort out. If you've got plants that are affected by them, what I would suggest you do is uh, the first thing you do is pull the leaves off. Any any uh, leaves that you can see any evidence of, pull them off. If you can if you can actually take the whole plant out, that's probably the better thing. Because the thing is, if you the organic way of doing it is, if you've got um, a plant that's affected, when you've got all the plants around you that can potentially get affected, the best thing to do is just remove the plant altogether. Um, as as hard as that may be, sometimes the best thing to do is just take the whole plant out. If they are just affecting a few of the leaves, obviously remove those leaves, and hopefully the plant will recover from that. Um, what you can do is. Um, is if they have, um, is if the uh, the leaf miners have um, sort of dropped any of their sort of um, eggs and stuff like that, it'll be all over the ground. So what I would suggest you do is um, take the plant out and then um, dig the ground over underneath it and, and turn the top to the bottom and sort of bury the, you know, sort of bury the eggs and that sort of down under underground. So basically you kill them off. That will that will um, sort of get rid of most of them. What you can do. So obviously remove the leaves, remove the plant if possible, and then dig the ground over um, straight away. Um, the other thing that you can do is if you have got a recurring problem is put a trap crop in. So what, basically what you do is you plant the plant that you want, and then near it you plant um, a plant which is also susceptible to the same, um, same thing. Wait till the, the sacrificial plant gets infected, and then remove that out of the way, and then hopefully you've, you, you know, you've sort of captured it. The other thing that you can do is if you have got a plant that you're not particularly fond of and you don't want to get rid of it, what you can do is remove the leaves as best you can and then spray with neem oil. Um, give the leaves a good spray on the top of the bottom. It won't affect the, the actual mining um, insect, but as soon as it comes to the surface of the leaf, um, 
and there's and there's no more there, it'll it'll um, sort of you know sort of kill itself. So so you're looking for neem oil. Um, you, you, you can get it from various sort of health food shops and stuff like that, but basically make up a solution of that and spray it on, the instructions will be on the bottle. So I hope this episode has been of some use to you. Thank you to all of the support that you've given to the channel, and I do appreciate all of your comments and questions and everything, and I will see you on the next episode of Tips on the Garden.